great pleasure to welcome this week uh, Professor Ying Wu from uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And uh, Professor Yu uh, is going to talk about the designs of acoustic metamaterials from effective medium to deep learning. Professor, Professor Yu. Okay, so let me get this. Uh, uh, there's a pointer. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Sebastian. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining this web webinar. My name is Ying Wu and, and I'm from KAUST. So uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, offering me, me this uh, great opportunity to talk in this uh, uh, fantastic platform and, and to share with uh, our research uh, results here. And uh, so today I'm going to talk something about acoustic metamaterials. Basically, I'll show you how this, uh, at the beginning, the effective medium uh, inspired us to design new uh, acoustic metamaterials. And now, very recently, we have uh, uh, as, uh, have this uh, new design of uh, uh, acoustic cloak inspired by these uh, or uh, assisted by deep learning. Well, this is the outline of uh, of my talk. So first, I'll start with a very brief uh, background introductions, and then I'll show you like this uh, effective medium theory inspired designs of acoustic metamaterials, which I uh, consider it as a uh, principle guided. So I'll show three examples, like 3D uh, acoustic double zero index material, an acoustic personal effect for enhanced emission, and finally the scattering cancellation for spinning acoustic objects. And uh, then I'll uh, show you how this uh, very state-of-the-art artificial intelligence inspired us to design the new acoustic metamaterials. And finally, um, I'll talk about some of the, uh, the conclusion I'll look. Well, uh, I believe um, most of the audience here are familiar with uh, uh, metamaterials and also familiar with uh, this uh, uh, secret behind the metamaterials. So here I, uh, on this screen, I show a um, um, gray rectangle. And without showing a magnified view of this gray rectangle, we cannot tell if this uh, gray rectangle is uniformly gray or uh, have some internal structures. But with this magnified view, we can see it very clearly that this gray rectangle is not uniformly gray. It comprises a lot of gray circles. So why can us see this uh, uh, gray circles at the first place? Because they are too small to be resolved by our eyes. Therefore, our eyes only see them in an average sense. Well, why do we see this gray circle is a gray, not green, not blue. Well, the answer is very simple because these little gray circles are gray. Okay, it carries the color information of gray. It is not blue or green. So here, uh, there are two takeaway message. First is our eyes cannot resolve fine little structures. We can only see them in a so-called average sense. And number two is we can still get some information carried by these fine structures. Well, the same thing happens in wave propagation. So when the wave propagated in a material, and if the wavelength is much larger compared to the typical like uh, size of these microstructures, the wave will not be able to see these fine little details. It will pass through the material like as if it is passing through a homogeneous material. And uh, this homogeneous material has a macroscopic response that is characterized for acoustic waves, the bulk uh, modulus and uh, mass density. So the effective medium actually uh, is a bridge that uh, connecting the micro, uh, microstructures to the microscopic response. <coughs> so the, the matter material uh, gain its uh, intriguing properties for the microscopic response. And people need to design the microstructures and in order to achieve the desired microscopic response. So the effective median indeed provide a some kind of designing tools or the guidance help us to design the new uh, uh, matter material. But the effective median itself has a long, long history. It can be dated back to uh, over a hundred or more years ago. So the conventional effective median theories are valid in the so-called quasi-stack limit. 
And here I want to introduce what are defined, what are these limits? So we have, um, uh, we know that the wavelength depends on the material. And uh, for a very simple two component composite, we have three wavelengths. The wavelength in the scatter or the wavelength in the background or and the wavelength in the effective medium if there is. So the coarse static limit uh, actually requires all of the three wavelengths in the background, in the scatter, and in the effective medium to be very large compared to the typical size of this microstructure. But for metal materials, the resonance well occurs and the conditions no longer hold. So our purpose is to go beyond this coarse static limit to have some effective medium that can uh, characterize the uh, resonances for metal materials. And this table summarizes our contributions in this field. So we developed different effective medium theories based on these methods, and their pros and cons are highlighted in green and red, and the representative publications are listed here as well. And today, for the sake of time, I would only be able to focus on uh, the first one, uh, coherent potential approximation, which is also, you can see, this one connects all the research pro, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, progress and uh, briefly mention the field averaging. So now I'm going to show uh, what are our effective medium theories and how they guided us in design new acoustic matter materials. Well, um, as, uh, as I mentioned, I'll talk about the coherent potential approximation. Well, if we encounter like a two component composite, Basically, we have two commonly encountered microstructures, as uh, uh, summarized in Professor Pinchon's book. That one is the so-called dispersion, uh, dispersed inclusion, where you can see that uh, phase one is suspended in phase two, and the phase two are indeed connected. And the other is the so-called symmetric geometry, that uh, phase one and two actually are equivalent. So in our metamaterials approach, we usually have periodic structures. And in this case, of course, this belongs to the first uh, geometry that uh, we have uh, uh, the scatters always suspended in the background. And by the way, here, the effective medium theory, I'm referring to the two dimensional ones. And this is uh, for an elastic wave where we have uh, uh, bulk modulus, shear modulus, mass density, and this is the radius. And this is uh, uh, the parameters of the scatters. And the coherent potential approximation, the spirit of this uh, CPA approach is, if this material is homogenizable, I can replace this whole thing by the effective medium. Well, it doesn't hurt that I leave one scatter here and also with its surrounding, one layer of this surrounding. And the thickness of this uh, uh, coated sphere satisfies the filling ratio of the original one. And because this medium is isotropic, so I can put this out boundary as a circle. Everywhere is equivalent. Every direction is equivalent. And outside is uh, the effective medium. And now the question is becoming to solve this problem. And to solve this problem, if this uh, um, uh, effective medium is correct, that means I can also replace this concentric cylinder by an effective medium. And that means that this, uh, the scattering of this uh, uh, coated cylinder should vanish inside this, uh, in this effective medium background. And now I need to introduce like the scattering matrix um, for those who are not familiar with this uh, uh, language, that the scattering matrix is represents the incident wave, connecting the incident wave to the scattered wave. Okay, so mathematically, it is ex expressed in this way that we solve the wave equation in different domains and for a single scatter, and uh, then the scatter wave connect the incident wave uh, multiplied by the scattering, scat uh, scattering matrix, and then we have the scatter wave. And this scattering matrix, actually, you can see here, this is a scattering, uh, mean scattering coefficients, which can be determined by the boundary conditions at the interface between this. Uh, uh, cylinder uh, or the scatter in the background. And alpha beta refers to uh, longitudinal transfers, so they have uh, different uh, scatterings for um, uh, for elastic waves. And with this, and going back to the uh, previous uh, effective median condition, 
that this uh, structural unit equivalent is equivalent to the effective medium. That means the total scattering should vanish in the effective medium. And therefore, we derive the so-called effective medium condition that this scattering, uh, this um, scattering coefficient should be equal in the background and also for these uh, uh, single scatters. And by taking some certain limits, we can get these uh, is the effective medium theory that I derived many years ago. And the key thing is uh, that it indeed the left hand side, you can see it's uh, the microscopic response, the effective media parameters, and the right hand side is the scatter mis scattering coefficients, the microstructures. So indeed, it connect the microscopic response to the microstructures. And what I want to uh, draw your attention is that we have the bulk modules connected to the monopole resonance and uh, the uh, mass density connected to the dipole resonance D1 and the shear modulus connected to the quadruple resonance. So it's this field map inspired us to have some uh, thought about the possible designs of, uh, um, of uh, uh, elastic matter materials. So this is a seminal work uh, by Professor Ping Shen that uh, uh, we use, uh, they use a hard core and to enhance the uh, dipole resonance. And then we asked, can we use multiple heavy objects to manipulate different uh, resonances? So then we come up with this design where we have uh, multiple hard cores that in order to, you can see it uh, resembles the shape in order to enhance different uh, resonances. And uh, um, indeed, we calculate the band structure and find that uh, uh, in this system indeed support different uh, multiple resonances, like here is a monopole resonance. You can have these uh, four cylinders moves in collectively in unison. And this is uh, this two moving outward and this two moving uh, inward. Okay, so this was uh, uh, also a long time ago work. And then we ask, uh, can we still apply some effective medium? Well, in this case, the previously mentioned the coherent potential approximation no longer applies because that require quite you know this uh, uh, symmetric uh, geometry and then we ask what can we do well um, indeed the effective median is that we only cares about the response we don't care what happens inside so we um trying to uh trying to just think about the boundary then uh inside this is a, a we, we consider it as a black box so we only uh, look at the boundary response and see if uh, we can get some effective medium properties there. Indeed, uh, we uh, do some the field field averaging that we integrate on the boundaries of these fields, and then by applying the constitutive equation to get the uh, corresponding effective parameters. And then, indeed, this works that for these uh, two band, we find that. Uh, uh, by using that field averaging method, we can calculate uh, numerically the effective kappa and effective mu, and which all shows a negative uh, value in this uh, frequency bands, and also the um, effective mass density is negative. That's why we have negative bands here. So I'm not going to uh, too much details about this uh, early work. I just want to sh uh, use this example to sh give you some idea how these uh, uh, effective medium theory uh, inspired us to design acoustic uh, or elastic matter materials. And later we extend the theory into the electromagnetic and uh, for acoustic waves. And then actually this also helped us to think if we can get something analytically, and then we developed this uh, Green's function based effective medium, where uh, we know that for a homogeneous medium, the Green's function uh, is uh, related to uh, the material parameters. While on the other hand, we can uh, calculate the green function both analytically or numerically by using its eigenfunctions. Okay, and uh, by applying the green theorem, and then we actually can connect these two green function and then uh, to solve for the effective parameters. Again, I'm also not going to the details of this uh, effective medium and just to uh, show you how do we uh, have this uh, work coming out. And uh, then uh, it's a uh, focus of today's, uh, today's webinar. 
that is uh, inspired by the effect median. How do we design these double zero index materials? So this work was uh, accomplished by uh, uh, Dr. Chang Qing Xu in my group, and also in collaboration with uh, Professor Yun Lai at Nanjing University and Professor uh, Guan Suoma at uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. So this uh, phase uh, parameter phase diagram shows us about you know these uh, 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 proper uh, uh, possible combinations of uh, uh, wave propagation for acoustic materials, and uh, today uh, we are focused on what happens. Well, we know if um, we have uh, these uh, parameters uh, on the axis, that means one of the parameters is zero, and this is a so-called single zero medium. And what happens on the origin is that we have double zero medium. And uh, the double zero median actually uh, uh, the same as the single zero median because the refractory index equals to zero, the wave does not experience any phase change. But for compared to the single zero median, the double zero median have a finite impedance because uh, for the single zero material, you have either impedance equals to zero or infinity, which are uh, extreme uh, values. And another thing is uh, the double zero index median, it can be proved that uh, it will support linear dispersion relation at the brown zone center. So in this case, uh, also another branch has been opened that is all about, you know, these uh, uh, Dirac dispersions and the topological stuff. So I'm also not going to talk in this into this field. And just to think about the zero index median, the question is, how do we achieve how can we achieve the uh, double zero index material? And uh, by knowing that uh, it has a lot of intriguing properties. Well, going back to the effective medium. So um, actually the just now the CPA reveals that uh, the effective parameters is actually associated with uh, different order of resonances, either monopole or dipole resonances. So now the trick is uh, how do we engineer these uh, uh, resonances? And uh, uh, this is the acoustic version of a uh, effective median that uh, I derived uh, uh, by using the CPA long uh, again a long time ago. And uh, here I want to emphasize that uh, uh, to achieve uh, obtain this uh, uh, equation, we only need the if, uh, wavelength in the effective median to be uh, large. We don't have any uh, constraints on the wavelength in the background or in the scatter. So. With this one, actually, Professor C.T. Chen came up with uh, this uh, design for electromagnetic wave, the double zero index material, uh, using these uh, uh, dielectric cylinders. And uh, also, they came up with this idea of uh, using rubber cylinders, put it in water to achieve this uh, um, double zero index material. And, uh, uh, well, for rubber cylinders, we know that rubber su uh, uh, support low velocity. And uh, but rubber also contains a lot of uh, internal resonances. Okay, so this is uh, something that we have to overcome if uh, we want to have some uh, very clean um, double zero index matter material. And also another question is, um, how about the airborne sound that uh, the acoustic wave in air, and how about three dimensional case? Well, for there uh, this uh, problem. Uh, is quite actually this is a quite challenging because so we know that uh, for uh, acoustic wave propagating air, uh, it, the air all support a very low velocity, and usually the sound propagates faster in uh, normal liquids or solids, and there is no support, you know, in air. It's uh, difficult. You cannot just uh, suspend some kind of uh, uh, you know this object in 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 in, in into the air without any support. Well, um, so to achieve the uh, double zero index material for sound wave in air, and uh, here Professor Xiang Zhang's group came up with this very clear idea that to utilize the higher order waveguide mode. It's not fundamental mode. You can see it actually changed the face. They have two plates, and uh, uh, but it the higher order waveguide mode indeed supports. If you look from the uh, in plane, it's uh, supports the monopole mode and the dipole resonances, and they make them uh, degenerate and generate this. Uh, so they got the double zero index material uh, for the um, airborne sound. And still, 
how about three dimensional case? Okay, so we actually uh, uh, spend quite some effort in order to realize that. And then my postdoc Changqing came up with this uh, very clever design that it has uh, uh, utilized, uh, he utilized the glide symmetry that put uh, like alumni rods into this fashion. And um, then be, uh, if you look at it from a more symmetric view, the unit can be viewed uh, plot like this. And it's, it is uh, symmetric, okay? And uh, so it uh, has uh, these uh, degenerated uh, dipolar resonances and it by tuning its uh, structures, you can also tune the monopole resonances. So this is the result that we calculated and we do find a linear dispersion, the Dirac point here, and which is uh, uh, the degeneracy of one monopole mode and the three dipolar modes. And by using the field averaging, we can calculate the effective parameters, and we do find that both the effective mass density and the inverse of the uh, bulk, effective bulk modulus pass through zero simultaneously at this frequency. Okay, and then with this, we did some uh, calculation and in, uh, the, the 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 experiments that uh, uh, for a uh, we designed a three dimensional acoustic periscope that uh, we have bended we got here and if uh, inside this uh, red region is filled with uh, uh, double zero index material so this is the um, effective material and this is the crystal so we can see that uh, uh, with this uh, fitting the wavefront is always preserved the plan wavefront but uh, with this one well the fitting is removed that of course the wavefront is uh, seriously um, destroyed and this is a picture of the experimental setup. And uh, also, uh, this is a measurement results. And we do see uh, by using this, uh, you know, this uh, Fourier transform, and we find this, uh, um, this dot here. And we do see at the direct frequency, and we have the dot. And away from that, we have uh, like a, uh, a spot. So these uh, um, uh, experiments, it essentially um, verifies these uh, or uh, the, the the acoustic periscope. So, the first conclusion about this is uh, we propose a practical design of a three-dimensional acoustic double zero index medium, and fabricated an acoustic periscope. And this design route may be extended to other wave systems. And uh, we have already generated into the uh, electromagnetic waves and uh, the uh, work is uh, still under review and here actually i want to say that uh, for acoustic waves and uh, electromagnetic waves in 3d they are so different it's not like 2d's that uh, uh, they are mathematically equivalent but in 3d they are very different one is uh, the longitudinal wave and the other is the shear wave and uh, when it comes into some functionalities these two uh, have completely different behaviors And then I'll show you that uh, how well during our design of acoustic double zero index material, and then we found these uh, acoustic Purcell effect, the structure that uh, can enhance the acoustic source emission. And this work was uh, uh, accomplished by my former uh, postdoc, Dr. Jiaxun Zhao, and in collaboration with uh, Professor Li Kui Zhang in uh, in the United States. Well. Just now I mentioned that uh, because uh, the sound wave in air propagate uh, very slow, so it's very hard to have some uh, structures that can support even slower wave speed than in that in air. And then Professor Jensen Lee uh, in year 2013 came up with this uh, idea of using calling up space to effectively increase the refractive index by elongating the propagation length. Okay, so then this can tackle the low index problem. And they indeed find the so-called, uh, these uh, double zero index material uh, by using this uh, uh, calling up structure. And the effective median parameters were derived from by using uh, S parameter retrieval by them. And we also, actually we, um, we were inspired by this. And uh, um, well, um, we want to find something that uh, uh, actually, initially also could, uh, related to this uh, uh, double zero index material, but then we find something more interesting. 
that is uh, even with this uh, like uh, circular geometry, the structure, and this can enhance the uh, um, emission rate of an acoustic uh, monopole source. So um, to analyze this, we also developed an effect median theory. Actually, this uh, structure was first proposed by Professor uh, Xiaojun Liu's group uh, in the in year 2015. And uh, initially, there was a isotropic effect medium adopted that uh, it introduces a virtual layer, which is uh, a little bit arbitrary, and also this material is uh, isotropic. And then during our studies, we find that uh, by using this effect medium, to a certain extent, this effect medium does not apply. Then we ask ourselves, so what's the reason behind that? And then we find actually this material, the, 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 the reason is quite simple because this material is anisotropic. So uh, from an isotropic approximation, it can only to like certain extent accurate. And then we develop an anisotropic effective medium model from the coupled mode theory. And to make the long story short, we adopt this uh, two-step homogenization. That is uh, first, we treat this uh, uh, very long, you know, this uh, zigzag path into a short one by also by changing its effective uh, 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 velocities. Okay. And then we do a azimuthal effect medium and uh, by using the coupled mode theory. And eventually we came up or derived this uh, effect medium that the this is the uh, velocity, effective velocity, and this is the effective mass density. And the key message is that the effective mass density is anisotropic. So uh, along different, the radial direction and axial direction, they are different. And this uh, better characterize the uh, feature of uh, this, um, uh, this uh, structure. And then we calculate the uh, emission rate. So we have uh, this uh, figure, you can see this is the figure here. We have this device and in the center, there are uh, this uh, blue dot marks the possible locations for the source to be put. So we actually put on different locations, but this figure shows that uh, we put a monopole source at the center. And then you can see with, with the wrap and without this device, the far field acoustic pressure field is significantly different. With the wrap, this uh, field is significantly enhanced. Well, without, it's very weak. Because so we know that uh, uh, the low frequency acoustic source emission is, uh, uh, is very poor. Okay. And um, then we um, also, uh, we realize this might be the acoustic analog of the so-called Purcell effect, where here is the quantum case and here is the acoustic case with the uh, uh, cavity device that changes the uh, uh, density of states so that uh, enhance the uh, uh, power emission uh, rate. And this uh, shows, this figure shows the acoustic Purcell factor and uh, you can see that uh, uh, the solid line is uh, calculated from uh, the full wave simulation and dotted lines are calculated from the effective medium. So they agree with each other very well. And our experimental collaborators fabricated a sample and did the measurements. And uh, indeed, they observed this uh, uh, enhancement. And this may have the application to uh, uh, significantly reduce the size of the acoustic device for low frequencies. So that's in the future, imagine that might be uh, portable stereos. And one thing I also want to draw your attention is something that we find very interesting is um, for these uh, uh, highly anisotropic material, we put the anis uh, in, uh, anisotropy into the equation and find that the wave equation can be modified into this form. And uh, uh, in terms of the solution, uh, inside and outside of the device, it's all more or less similar to the uh, isotropic case where we have based on Hankel functions. But inside, in this uh, uh, layers, uh, I mean, in the effective, uh, you know, these uh, layers, we find that uh, the pressure is actually uh, um, written as uh, this uh, based on Hankel function combinations. But please pay attention to the subscript. Here, this mu equals to m is the basal order, m as a musical order, and then modified by these ratio, rho r over rho theta. Remember, our rho theta goes to infinity. 
So that means inside this device, only the zeros order um, base off function is supported. And uh, uh, we can uh, look at these resonances. So we have different multiple order and they all occurs at the same frequency. So that we call it degenerate uh, me resonance. And uh, this uh, uh, will also have a lot of uh, interesting consequences. Okay, and we are still working on that uh, on this part. Well, for the acoustic personal effect, we designed an enclosure that can significantly enhance the source emission rate at low frequencies, and we develop a two-step effect median to um, characterize this uh, system. And we found the degenerate mean resonances, and also we fabricated the sample and confirmed the acoustic personal effect. And uh, for major uh, publications associated with this project, you may refer to uh, this two paper. Well, uh, and then uh, actually from uh, coherent potential approximation, when naturally think about uh, something called scattering cancellation. And this uh, was accomplished by Dr. Mohammed Fahart and in collaboration with uh, Professor Gunu and uh, Professor Alou. So, these uh, uh, two figures shows uh, like compare the uh, relation between the CPA and the scattering cancellation. So in the coherent potential approximation, we know this is a scatter and this is the coating. Uh, this is a background. And what we don't know and we want to achieve is the effective parameters. Well, in scattering cancellation, this is the um, scatter that uh, we want to uh, be cloaked. And this is the environment. The outside is environment. What we don't know is the middle layer. What kind of geometry and per material parameters uh, of this uh, middle layer can make cancel out the scattering. So in both cases, the scattering, the total scattering vanishes in the background. Okay, so here it's uh, this uh, uh, coated the scattering of this uh, coated cylinder vanishes in the effective medium, and here is uh, coated cylinders. The scattering vanishes in the uh, background. So you can see they share certain. Uh, they have some uh, connections and they share some certain uh, similarities here. And uh, uh, there has been a lot of uh, contributions of scattering cancellation. And I believe a lot of our uh, expert is standing he, uh, is sitting here in the audience. So I'm not going to talk into uh, this literature. And what we have uh, uh, done is uh, to analyze the scattering of uh, some spinning objects. That uh, means that you can see the object has uh, some uh, angular uh, velocity. Okay. And the most challenging part actually is to formulate this problem and trying to obtain the scattering coefficients and uh, construct the mathematical problem. And uh, uh, Dr. Fahart really did a lot of work. And so uh, we found that uh, actually this uh, spinning modifies the wave vector. And of course, so also modifies the boundary conditions. So the boundary condition is a uh, continuity of the pressure field and also the continuity of the normal displacement. And with this, we can solve for the scattering coefficients. And here, this result is obtained by assuming that uh, the material actually, the, um, the, 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 the inclusion and the background is of the same material, but uh, we only want to see what's the effect of the spinning. Okay, so these are the uh, scattering coefficients. And then consider we have a shell and uh, we uh, derive again this uh, scattering coefficients and the dominant term is uh, by the uh, zeros order and the first order and higher order uh, well if uh, we have a uh, small objects and uh, uh, low frequencies so the dom uh, the, the 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 higher order scatterings are uh, like in high order in, in 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 frequency and in this case so we want to uh, look into this uh, this uh, scattering coefficients, and indeed they are very complex. And this gamma represents the uh, geometry, and uh, this alpha represents the spinning, uh, the ratio between the uh, spinning, uh, these uh, uh, angular velocity and the wave frequency. And alpha two uh, 
indicate the also the ratio between the, 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 the spinning of the shell and also the frequency. So you can see it's uh, quite quite complex. Okay. And um, in order to cancel the scattering, and uh, so uh, we did some uh, simulations and find where the total scattering goes to zero. And, uh, uh, and then we found that uh, uh, actually we can have a uh, counter uh, like rotation uh, structure to uh, conceal this uh, spinning object. And of course, we can also have uh, uh, like the same uh, uh, along the same directions of the spinning. But this is, uh, uh, well, the solution of uh, to this equation that uh, having this equals to zero. Okay, so as long as uh, this uh, total scattering vanishes and we can have a bunch, a set of uh, uh, parameters that to cancel the uh, scattering. And we also find that uh, for a hard object and with uh, this um, uh, rotation uh, shell, we can cloak uh, the, uh, the hard object. So that's uh, also, it's a very uh, interesting that uh, we don't need to uh, use very, you know, this uh, negative uh, uh, properties or some extreme uh, parameters to do this uh, scattering cancellation. And this figure shows that uh, uh, this is a without the, or the bare object, the uh, uh, pointing vector, and this is a face. And with the object, you can see that uh, the field is indeed, this object is indeed cloaked. So this is uh, uh, for the scattering cancellation of a spinning object. So we proposed uh, the detailed analysis of spinning acoustic object and their scattering properties and uh, to provide a framework to analyze this uh, scattering uh, problem and also developed this uh, scattering cancellation theory and designed the shell to conceal the object in the static limit. And uh, uh, the details can be found in this publication uh, uh, last year. And now I want to do a, uh, for the first part, I want to have a brief summary of this. So you can see everything started from the effective medium. The coherent potential approximation actually connects the microscopic uh, uh, behavior, namely the different orders of uh, scattering coefficients to the macroscopic response of the material. And with this, we have some idea of if I want to have a desired material property, what kind of resonances can I uh, engineer? And then we, as I uh, showed as the first example, that uh, we um, engineer these uh, multiple resonances to have negative index uh, in different material parameters. And uh, also uh, to manipulate the monopole and the dipole resonances to achieve this uh, uh, double zero index material. And this double zero index material will lead to linear dispersion and also this uh, open the whole branch of uh, topological physics. So connection between them, which is also my one of my research uh, interest, but uh, today I, I'm not going to tell this. And uh, uh, to achieve double zero index material uh, for airborne sound, we want to have some high uh, refractive index material, which is very difficult to uh, obtain by uh, naturally occurring materials. So this is uh, uh, how cooling up space come into play. And then this leads to the so-called acoustic Purcell effect. And on the other hand, the coherent potential approximation is naturally related to the scattering cancellation. And uh, we study this uh, um, spinning object, the how to can, uh, cancel the scattering of uh, this uh, acoustic spinning object. So this uh, is, uh, uh, conclude my first, uh, the first part of my talk that how these principle guided us to design the new acoustic matter materials and after design, how do we characterize them? It's like you, uh, we, um, use two, uh, legs to, uh, move forward. So one step is effective median and then guided us design new materials. And then we develop a um, new theory to characterize this material and then move forward. And now from the last part of the scattering cancellation, and we already see that uh, scattering cancellation for one single layer shell to determine the shell is uh, uh, already very challenging for this uh, uh, spinning object. 
And also, we uh, we know that uh, in the literature of this uh, scattering cancellation, we have uh, you know sometimes involve very um, uh, extreme material parameters and uh, also uh, resonance based. This uh, um, material also involves you know uh, very um, narrow bandwidth. So then um, uh, we ask ourselves: Can we have some more efficient way to? Uh, design this um, meta materials. So here comes the deep learning assisted uh, broadband acoustic cloak of invisibility, and this was accomplished by uh, Dr. Uh, Wakas Ahmed and uh, also in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Fahart. And uh, uh, we we are uh, we received a lot of. Uh, um, assistance from uh, Professor Xiang Liang Zhang, my colleague, who is an expert in uh, deep learning. So well, here some uh, gives us the this uh, I was a page that I uh, uh, showed uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. So here we have uh, uh, like uh, we want to determine this shell, and uh, we have very complex uh, expressions here. And uh, of course, we can we can do this still. We can do this, but this is uh, involves many cycles of trial and error use uh, uh, process. And our goal is to achieve a broadband and feasible cloak of invisibility for normal acoustic object. It's not spinning, just for normal acoustic object. Actually, this is already very challenging, given that we want to have broadband. So this is the physical problem that we want to do. It's uh, this uh, is the object we want to cloak, and here we have a uh, full. Multiple, uh, four layers of cloak, uh, cloaking structures. And then our goal is to cancel the total scattering uh, cross section to achieve this uh, scattering cancellation. And uh, these uh, scattering um, coefficients can be obtained by using the transform uh, standard transform matrix method for this uh, multi layer structure. So you can see, indeed, this problem is already very challenging because uh, we have multiple layers. So uh, here uh, we designed this uh, deep learning model and this uh, slide shows uh, is an illustration of our uh, deep learning model that we have this uh, uh, neural network. And for the forward problem, we have the design parameters as the input and output is the spectrum of the scattering uh, uh, cross sections. And then um, the inverse uh, problem is that we have the user spectrum as the input and the, the parameters, the design model, the parameters as the output. So what we want to do is to learn this uh, non-linear uh, functions that connecting this uh, uh, forward process and uh, inverse process. And this is a standard. Actually, uh, there's nothing uh, surprising here. So this uh, states our basic problem that uh, for we fix the object and we also fix the mass density of each layer. And what we want to design is the uh, bulk modulus and their geometries. And uh, uh, the response is uh, the scattering cross sections. And uh, for this uh, frequency band, we divide it into 100 steps. So basically, the design parameters, we have eight numbers. And uh, uh, in the response, we have 100. And the performance is uh, measured by the normalized scattering cross section, which is the uh, cloak, uh, the, the the scattering with the cloak uh, divided by the scattering cross section with, um, of the bare object. If this goes to zero, that means uh, uh, the object is indeed cloaked. So the total we generated uh, fixed uh, sixty eight thousand samples, and uh, where sixty thousand was used for training, and four thousand samples were used for validation. And 4,000 samples were used for testing. And for the forward design, where the input layer, we have eight parameters here, and output layer, we have 100. Okay, so we have the input design parameters, and then we have these uh, output uh, uh, to learn the output, um, output response uh, of the spectrum. And uh, in between, this uh, uh, neural network contains uh, four layers. And um, each layer have these nodes, and uh, the forward uh, design is uh, is not uh, is quite trivial 
that uh, this is the learning curve that we can see that uh, the loss function indeed for both training and validation uh, uh, converges after uh, 400 epochs. And uh, uh, the relative error is uh, below 5%. Okay, and if we look at some uh, predicted spectrum and we can see this uh, uh, solid black, uh, blue lines are uh, from the transform matrix method and uh, the dash lines are from uh, machine learning model. And so you can see that uh, uh, they are almost overlapping and the absolute error is indeed very small. So that uh, gave us the confidence that uh, our forward network is uh, well trained. And for the inverse design, where we have the input layer as the spectrum response, while the output layer uh, is the desired parameters. And then here come some issues. Even though the training data is converging, but the validation data is um, no longer goes down here. And uh, what's the problem there? And actually, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's not difficult uh, to explain. This uh, uh, validation uh, behavior indicates the overfitting, and the overfitting is uh, becoming of the non-unique solution in the inverse problem. Namely, we have one spectrum, but we may have multiple solutions to the uh, to the design uh, parameters. So then we the 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 this uh, uh, actually it's uh, just this problem uh, makes it very challenging to train the inverse network. So then how to tackle this issue? Then we borrow this idea is uh, the so-called um, uh, auto encoder and decoder like uh, network. So the uh, underlying you know, this uh, uh, principle is that before we have this inverse network and then Rather than the output is the spectrum, uh, the, is the uh, parameter, and uh, we connect a pre-trained forward network to this uh, uh, inverse network, and then the output becoming spectrum again. Okay, so this pre-trained uh, network, we train the forward network, and this trained network will help us to uh, eliminate those uh, uh, unwanted uh, solutions. So the it's just it behaves like a decoder. So the first step is to train the forward network, and the second step is to connect it to this uh, inverse network and train the inverse network while fixing the weight in the pre-trained uh, forward network. And then with this, the learning curve, you can see this uh, loss function is uh, significantly improved, and uh, the main error is below 5%. And uh, if we look at the predicted spectrum, and it indeed, the uh, the um, uh, the network gives uh, the machine learning gives us uh, some uh, the results that uh, is uh, uh, overlapping with the uh, full wave simulation. So this uh, is so called deterministic network provides one set of design parameters for the desired response. Well, if I say this is the end of the story, and then there's nothing new here, and also if you talk to your experimental collaborator, okay, please fabricate fabricate this. Uh, uh, sample and I need uh, your parameters should be accurate up to the four digits. Okay, and I don't think anyone would like to fabricate the sample for for you. So then we want to say, can we have some like more realistic designs? That is comes uh, here comes the probabilistic inverse network design. So here we add a uh, uh, another layer, and this layer rather than learning, you know, some deterministic some particular uh, value, we learn a distribution. So we let this uh, parameters have this distribution with the uh, mean as uh, de uh, denoted as mu and the variance as sigma. So we, uh, this is uh, some like a generative uh, uh, model that uh, can uh, give us a distribution of the parameters. So we give you a distribution within this distribution uh, you can have these uh, parameters. And the loss function is characterized by these uh, formula. And again, this formula, actually, you can find it in a uh, in this uh, work. And the first term is a standard, you know, to measure the, uh, to, 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 to characterize these uh, uh, standard network. And it's a uh, uh, mean uh, absolute error. And uh, 
The second term is to guarantee that we learn a Gaussian distribution. And the last term is our contribution that uh, we don't want these, uh, uh, these uh, variation to be very small. That uh, means that if you have a Gaussian distribution, but it's very, very, very narrow, the uh, standard deviation is very, is too small, then that does not make, you know, too much practical um, uh, importance here. And then with this, um, we, uh, this is the result of our uh, uh, probabilistic inverse uh, network that we can see that the train and the validation also uh, converges and uh, the mean error is uh, about 6%. And these are the um, learned parameters of, uh, uh, we find that uh, these uh, uh, kappa uh, has more standard deviation compared to the, uh, to the radius. And uh, we choose like this is the distribution you can see we learn the distribution and we choose the strings, two values of kappa kappa one and you can find a uh, almost similar response um and also for kappa two and kappa three and kappa four so indeed this uh, uh indicate that uh, our uh, learning is uh, effective and this shows the result that uh, without the clock, you can see the wave front is uh, uh, is uh, have um, some some wrinkles here, and with the clock, don't have you don't see any like this uh, disturbance of the wave front, and we also uh, did a uh, more re realistic case that is for steel cylinders in water, and we can see that uh, over this broad uh, frequency range, these scattering coefficient uh, scattering cross sections is indeed very low. So. To sum up, we achieved these uh, feasible design parameters for broadband acoustic clock, and we also designed and predicted uh, the uh, um, the predict uh, deterministic and a probabilistic deep um, deep learning mo deep model to solve the non-convergence issue using the auto encoder like structure, and uh, we also find the sensitivity of the design parameters. And for details, uh, you can refer to this uh, publication published a few months ago. All right, so uh, from this example, I just want to say a few comments about using the principle guided uh, way, like we can see that uh, these uh, uh, circumference uh, summarizes some applications. And we have uh, like these approaches with the principle guided, we have uh, some forward, you know, we uh, have a either effective median or first principle calculations, which give us a very beautiful, clear physical pictures. And uh, we, on the other hand, we need to have a, a some uh, understand, have some uh, knowledge about the uh, phys physical mechanisms behind this uh, uh, structure in order to have some designs. Like the effective median tells us the relation between the parameters and uh, um, and and uh, these uh, uh, scattering coefficients, and then you to uh, engineer the resonance and to get the desired properties. But this involves, as I said, many trial and error um, uh, steps, and also for one um, material or one uh, uh, one goal, you have uh, to uh, you have uh, one trial, and for the others, and you have to change. And people also developed these optimization methods where they search the full parameter space, which is more efficient, but also for one application, and they have to uh, have. Um, uh, change these optimization methods and for the deep learning that uh, uh, even though we need a large data to train the network, but once the network is trained, it almost simultaneously set uh, solve the problem, many problems at uh, in one take. Okay, so, but the deep learning, you don't need to have a uh, any, uh, you know, this uh, uh, background or to understand very deep about the mechanisms. So these are the difference, each have its pros and cons. And in the future, I think perhaps if uh, there is a way that can, you know, like hybrid this uh, two methods that uh, to in, uh, get, you know, this uh, deep learning to assist the principle guided design, which will be uh, help us to search for something that uh, originally may considered as impossible uh, to make it possible. 
and uh, also the uh, principal guided. Does that mean this uh, principal guided method uh, will be not useful? I don't believe so because uh, we still want to have uh, some, you know, these uh, uh, insights into these uh, structures, and we still have uh, want to use our insight to uh, guide the designs. And uh, this may help us. This may help us to maybe um, um, to 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 uh, like also assist this uh, data training. So, if, uh, like in the deep learning, we require large data, and sometimes this uh, uh, large data is uh, not easily achievable. So, is it possible that we can use some principle guided? Like these rules, and to help us to reduce, you know, these uh, the requirement or relax the requirements on the large data. So these are the all these uh, open questions that are for the future directions. So with that, I want to uh, conclude my talk, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Wu, for this fantastic talk. I think that we will have many questions uh, on this deep learning uh, method. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, so anyone wants uh, to start with the questions?